Good morning, friends. Today is a special day in the life of the church, a day when we pause to remember and honor all the saints who have gone before us. I think about all the saints in my life, and I imagine you think about all the saints in your life. I remember my father was the kind of man who brought sunshine to every room that he entered. He was in sales, need I say no more, they need to be sunshiny folks, right? And whenever he would walk into the office, and I often got to go to the office with him, when he walked in, the first thing he said was, with, with arms listed high, glory! And that's how he was known. He signed his cards. Glory, Basil. My mom was a nurse. She worked in the operating room. And from her, I learned compassion. From my father, I learned the power of a positive attitude, no matter what you may face. And I remember one time I... um, I was fired from a job, really through no fault of my own. I was working as the Director of Communications for the Department of Human Resources for Georgia. And I had left my job at the television station uh, where I was a producer and for years had worked with them. And they asked me to come on board and help promote other programs that they had. And I was hired by the commissioner. So I was her direct hire, direct report, and when she lost her job, Guess who got fired? And I was crushed. And I spent, it took me, I could have gone back into what was comfortable and familiar, gone back into television, but that brief moment into a different life had shown me that that's not what I was called to do. I wanted to have more regular hours not to work 24-7, seven days a week. And so I reinvented myself in the world of sales, and my father took me aside one day, and it was one of the proudest moments of my life when he told me how proud he was of me, that I got back up and got on my feet and found a new way forward. Maybe you've got somebody in your life that has encouraged you. Let's tell their stories. Let's share their stories. Does our family know those stories? Let's share them because those we loved and have lost live on every time we say their names. This morning, our scripture reading comes from Matthew 23, 1 through 12, and I'm going to read that in a moment. Before I read that passage, I want you to understand where it comes in the biblical canon. In Matthew 21, Jesus enters Jerusalem, and we all know where that's heading, right? That heads to the cross, where he gives his life for ours. And by Matthew 27, Jesus is crucified. In Matthew 26, just before that, he institutes the Lord's Supper, which we will observe at the close of our service today, even more special because we know that on the other side of this table are all the saints. Today, we feast with those we've loved and lost. But I'll read from Matthew 23 in just a moment, but first let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to respond to your words spoken into our lives today. Amen. Hear now the word of God from Matthew 23, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. 
Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to beat, and lay them on the shoulders of others. But they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, and all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I don't know about you, but Matthew 23 seems mighty rough on the Pharisees. Amen? We're probably all sitting in our seats and saying, I am so glad I am not a Pharisee. Just to give you a little context, there were some words I used in there that you may not know. In verse 5, I talked about they do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. Phylacteries were little leather pouches that they wore. And in those leather pouches, they had written the Torah, the law of the land that they were to observe. And the fringes, the longest fringes, signified those who were the most righteous. So they went around boasting about who they, they are and what they know. We may think that's not us. But before we breathe a sigh of relief, let us consider a modern-day Pharisee. A modern-day Pharisee is someone who emphasizes external appearances over the state of their heart. A modern-day Pharisee is someone who prioritizes strict adherence to rules and traditions over grace and mercy and love. A modern-day Pharisee excludes people who do not believe what they believe. A modern-day Pharisee is someone who preaches one set of rules and lives by another. A modern-day Pharisee is one who believes that they are better than someone else. Jesus challenged the Pharisees to examine their hearts. And he challenges us to examine ours. Jesus reminds us that the heart of faith is about a genuine love for God and for others rather than adhering to a checklist of religious tradition. One of the central messages of our passage this morning is authenticity. It is being the same person on a Sunday that we are on a Monday, being the same person in public that we are in private. It means living what we believe. You hear that often from this pulpit. We talk about it almost every Sunday. Authenticity flows out of having a deep relationship with Christ. We are not perfect. We cannot ever be perfect. But we worship a perfect God. And when we have a close relationship with Christ, it refines us and it begins to shine through us. 
one of the best ways to develop a deep relationship is through constant conversation with God, through a deep relationship with Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had friends through the years, and the ones that I never have conversations with, those, some of those oldest friends, the relationship is not so close anymore, right? We keep that close relationship with someone when we are in constant conversations. Our families are a good example, I guess because we have to talk to them, right? I hope we want to talk to them. But we stay in touch with each other through those constant conversations, and that's what prayer is. So that's where this passage led me to think about how do I develop an authentic relationship with Christ? And the best way is through prayer, through truly praying, through truly having that deep relationship with Jesus. As we study this morning passage, I want to apply what we learn to the true nature of our Christian life, to the nature of prayer. The first lesson I read from this passage is that we connect through God, through sincere prayer, right? We're sincere. In Matthew 23, Jesus makes a clear distinction between the empty performance-based religion of the Pharisees and the genuine relationship that God calls us to have. The Pharisees were more concerned with appearances, making their prayers and religious acts in public places where they could be seen and admired and noticed. But Jesus is calling us to something deeper. When we are having honest conversations with God, there may be times when we do not have words. I think about those days following my husband's passing. And honestly, I still have days like that today, if I'm being honest. Two years later, where I simply don't have the words. And I am so grateful that God gave me the sound of a baby in my life, just like he's given us the sound of a baby in this church to remind us of the life we have yet to live. In those moments when I cannot pray, I think about Psalm 5, the first few verses. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Give heed to my sighing. Other translations say to my groaning. Listen to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice, in the morning I plead my case to you, and I walk. So even when we don't have the words to pray, God hears us. He hears the sighs of our hearts. Prayer is our lifeline to our Creator, our direct line to His heart. And when we pray, we're invited into an intimate conversation to God. And not only do we speak to God, sharing the sighs of our hearts, but we also are still so that we may hear God speak to us. God doesn't require fancy words or a stage. What he wants is sincerity and openness. So, church, I have a question for you today. What is our prayer life like right now? Is it routine, perhaps something we do before meals or at bedtime? Or is it a place where we truly connect with God, where we have come to a place in our lives where we are in constant conversation with God, where everything we say and everything we do is bathed in prayer?
when we are praying this way, we are able to love others as Christ loved us. And I say this today, in the days leading up to an election, and someone will be disappointed with who wins. Whoever wins, Jesus is still Lord. And we must love each other in victory or defeat. I'm going to ask you a question. I know most of you are Georgia Bulldog fans. For the first half of that Georgia-Florida game, who did we love? Huh? Did we love Florida? <laughs> yes, we did. You'll know you're walking in a close relationship with Jesus when you can say, yes, I love them even then. Do you hear what I'm saying? That is God's truth. We love people who believe what we do. We love people who do not believe what we do. Like the saints before us, we're called to live lives of regular, sincere prayer, making time each day not only to speak to God, but to listen to God. And I hear God often when I read through the Psalms and through the prayers of others, the hymns of others. God speaks to us still today. The second lesson Jesus offers from our passage this morning is the importance of humility. So humility in prayer. Jesus' words in Matthew 23 remind us that true greatness in God's kingdom is found in humility. The greatest among you will be your servant, he says, for though exalt, those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is an essential lesson for us especially when it comes to prayer. Humility in prayer means coming before God with the recognition that we are utterly dependent on him. Every breath we take is by the grace of God. Every day we wake up, we give praise to God. It's realizing that we don't come to God because we're worthy. We come to God because he is gracious in his generous love of us. True prayer comes from a humble heart, one that acknowledges, Lord, I need you. I cannot do this without you. And let me tell you, I pray that prayer every day. Sometimes just getting out of the bed takes that prayer. And anyone who suffered loss knows of what I speak. I think about all the saints who have prayed for us through the years. They approached God not with pride, but with deep humility, knowing that everything they had, everything they were, came from the Lord. And so we too must come before God, not with a list of accomplishments, not with our big phylacteries, but with a heart that is open and humble, ready to receive his grace. The final lesson we need to learn is to make persistent prayer a lifestyle. Make that constant communication with God a lifestyle. Jesus encourages us throughout the Gospels to persist in prayer. He tells us to, to ask, to seek, to knock, right? So many passages that come to mind. To never give up bringing our needs to God. The saints we remember today, they may not have lived perfect lives. Neither do we. Because of this truth, God calls us to a life of persistent prayer. Returning to God again and again, no matter the season. In Matthew 23, Jesus teaches us that true discipleship isn't about public displays. It's about the state of our heart. And when the state of our heart is right with God, our lives reflect that. We will mirror his worth, 
not ours. So church, do we make time each day to connect with God? Are we approaching him with humility? Are we persistent in our prayers, in that constant conversation with God? Or do we give up when the answers don't come quickly or when the answers don't go our way or when our team doesn't win or our candidate doesn't win? No, we need to be persistent in prayer in all things. I want to encourage each of us to develop a consistent prayer life. I encourage you to have times of dedicated prayer, whether it's in the morning or in the evening, to pray with humility, recognizing that it's not about saying the right things or looking the part. It's about an honest conversation with God. It's about our heart being open. Let us seek God in every moment, in every situation, trusting that he hears us and he is with us. As we celebrate All Saints Day, let us remember the men and women, all those we have loved, who have gone on before us. Let us remember all the saints who walked faithfully with God, who prayed with sincerity, humility, and persistence. Their legacy is a gift to us. And now we ask ourselves, what will our legacy be? I pray that we leave a legacy of a life that reflects God's love and mercy and grace. And all God's people said, amen.